Once you've captured that attention and people start to consider, you know, mm, okay, maybe this is a priority for me. They're going to come further down the funnel. They want to evaluate. That's where you need to have content that establishes differentiation. This is Velocitize Talks. I'm Eric Jones. I'm here with Lucas Welsh, the Senior Director of Content and Communications for Highspot. Lucas, great to have you. Delighted to be here. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, Highspot and your unique value proposition in the marketplace. At its core, Highspot is really about people talking to people. And that may sound a little trite for a software company, but at the end of the day, what sales enablement is trying to do is to make the customer conversation, and that's the prospect conversation, the actual customer, all the way through their life cycle. Make that customer conversation as compelling and valuable as possible. And the irony, of course, is that AI actually plays a really big role in awesome conversations. And what we do is, using our software platform, we're able to analyze how content is used, what content drives engagement, what content actually contributes to revenue, what content is used the most after a customer has come on board and may be deploying the software or trying to learn best practices, and then what sales patterns, marketing patterns, are actually creating and driving revenue and growth for the business. And take all of that data and analyze it, then use it in our platform to give people guidance as to what to know, say, and show whenever they're having a conversation. So no matter the situation, you know something about who you're going to talk to, you know what you want to show them to demonstrate that value, and you know what to say to make that as compelling as possible. We're all talking about content for the buyer's journey. Um, tell us a little bit about some of those best practices that you've learned through uh, you know, that, that AI that you have um, so that we can all do a better job of actually creating content that moves you know, potential customers farther yeah. down the funnel. Certainly, some of my gut instincts are proven to be right from the data. So no one's going to read a 50-page vendor white paper. They may from a third party that's really credible, a Gartner, a Forrester, others depending on the industry that you're in. Um, but from a vendor perspective, they're looking for best practices. All right, so I've decided to potentially go with your solution or at least consider the concepts you're telling me. How do I put it into action? How do I make it real? Um, I think we've seen that multi-form factor, multimedia, certainly digital packages. If you want to drive real engagement with what you believe is rich, compelling, longer form content, it needs to be wrapped in more consumable bytes. And that's everything from your basic infographic to thinking about data visualizations and animations that you can include in your social channels. So I think there's certainly a movement towards consumable, easy to access content, but it still tells a story. It still has a cohesive narrative through it. From an awareness perspective, let's say, or if you choose, um, you know, from a consideration perspective, what type of content is better for which, which part of the funnel, do you think? Um, I certainly think at the top of the funnel, you want to drive urgency. So whatever the challenge is that your technology, your services may solve, you want to create urgency around that being a priority for the prospects, the personas that you're targeting. And then... That's kind of top of the funnel, is, is you create that why. And that may be quite cynical view of things, but I do think that there is urgency you need to drive at the top of the funnel to create a need for what it is your technology, service, et cetera, can solve. Once you've captured that attention and people start to consider, you know, mm, okay, maybe this is a priority for me, they're going to come further down the funnel, they want to evaluate, that's where you need to have content that establishes differentiation. I'm kind of curious, uh, from a content perspective, how much? what is your balance uh, that you're striking between, let's say, thought leadership content versus content that's more self-promotional or discusses your products? Mine, I try to aim for 70-30. So 70% 70 best practices, success patterns, thought leadership, and you know maybe you and I can brainstorm a better term than thought leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, I've literally gone to the thesaurus and tried to find the synonym for thought and the synonym for leadership that sound better together, but I've yet to be able to do so. Um, but the idea of being credible and being able to propose theories and ideas that people will latch on to is definitely something we try to do about 70% of the time. And that's across social, the blog, and our longer form content, including video and multimedia. And then 30% is we've got an event, we need to drive awareness. We have a keynote, we need to make sure people attend. Uh, we have a product launch, we want you to do a demo. 
Um, sometimes it's more 60-40. It depends on you know what we have going on, what milestones, what we're driving towards as a company for a given quarter. But you know, I, I think 70-30 feels comfortable and certainly puts us in a position to by and large be seen as an advisor who's offering, back to that progressive example, help to the buyer to make decisions. Hopefully those decisions come our way, but we also simply want to help the process and clarify the market. You're sitting in a pretty cool spot, uh, you know, overseeing aspects of earned media and, you know, some paid media and social media and then, uh, you know, owned media as well. Um, how are you ensuring that there's, you know, a lot of synergy between all of those different areas so that they're all mutually reinforcing? Oh, I wish I had the perfect equation to do that. I will say that I think one of the keys is to know what you are and what you aren't at a core. And that starts with partnership at the executive level from what is the executive team really trying to achieve? What are the goals for the year? Um, and one of ours, for instance, is around culture. And we want, you know, we have a lofty goal of 5.0 average on Glassdoor, right? Now, that would mean literally all perfect reviews on Glassdoor, which we're close, but not quite there. Um, really, pr awesome. really proud of the culture that we've built. But so that that thread, that theme is really important to us. What are some of the biggest things that companies, particularly tech companies, are getting wrong today in, in uh, Marcom? I'll, I'll sort of give an example. Like, you know, these overly grandiose mission statements that mm. we've seen, you know, some people have, right? Yes. Uh, you know, elevate the world's consciousness. You mean saying you're going to sell happiness and an sell S1 happiness, exactly. isn't necessarily S1, yeah. Whether the it's, most specific you know, mission statement? Yeah. Uh, high spot is trying to transform the way people work. And, and I think the people is the key crux of that. And that includes our employees, back to my statement about culture. We take helping our employees accelerate their career development very seriously, and we take helping our customers accelerate their business and their own careers very seriously. And so there is, I think, a transformative aspect to the value we are trying to offer. I also think you can take it too far. And I was having an interesting conversation with a legal counsel the other day, and he was telling me how you have to think about what can you measure. And so can you measure happiness? Maybe. Maybe there's some scientific way in the endorphins and whatnot. It's going to be harder for the SEC to feel like you can measure happiness. And so I think you always want to ground whatever your mission is in reality because no objective, no goal that doesn't have metrics associated with it, can you really learn are you doing well or not? And I've never thought measurement just for the sake of measurement is that valuable, but measurement to understand what's working and what's not and how you can, of course, do more of what's working and learn from what's not and evolve, I think is really important in terms of both self-reflection and the discipline of paying attention to both the qualitative and the quantitative. Yeah, I wonder uh, what you think about, you know, the importance of organizational alignment around values in a number of different ways. One is, you know, particularly as, as you know, we all market to younger uh, potential customers, yep. as well as, you know, as we begin to implement various AI solutions that sort of really push and make transparent what a company stands for yep. uh, and what the implications of all those, those things are. Um, so my daughter's 13 and uh, there were some Earth Day rallies and, and I wouldn't even call them protests. I, I looked at them as rallies for the planet Earth. And some of her classmates and her were talking about, do they go, do they skip school to go to this? And I thought to myself like, even if there was one when I was 13, I wasn't of the mindset that I would have considered missing basketball practice to go to an Earth Day rally. And not only was I proud of her for her awareness and for her friends' awareness and, and that they were really considering this in like a very adult, mature way, but I think it also shows that as the positive side of everything from artificial intelligence to technology has allowed younger and younger generations to understand more of the world around them much faster than I had the opportunity to do so. And so I think it is increasingly important in marketing to remember that there is so much information out there. And for the smart buyer, for the smart prospect, they not only know about you and your company and your technology if they've started to really evaluate you, but they're likely evaluating you on different trajectories and different vectors than you might have considered. It won't just be about is your product the best ROI? Last question that we love asking our guests is a book or a podcast that you'd like to recommend. 
Yeah, um, Dapper Dan's born in Harlem. It might be made in Harlem. Um, so Dapper Dan uh, was essentially an entrepreneur who in the 1980s started taking bootleg Gucci and Louis Vuitton fabrics and making everyone from Mike Tyson to infamous drug lords really gorgeous bespoke clothing. And he made a quiet amount of money doing it. And then eventually, of course, those brands realized what was happening and they sued him. And as opposed to welcome him in and say, this is really innovative, this is unique, let's partner together, the initial reaction was stay out of our business. And eventually Gucci had the vision a few years back to actually partner with him and welcome him in and say, hey, you can actually make us better. And you're tapping into a whole new line of revenue because it's at the end of the day, you still have to generate revenue um, that we haven't been able to tap into. So help us. And then when Gucci put out a sweater that was very insensitive and got them in a bit of trouble, he was able to not only take them a task for it, but credibly proffer a communication with the wider community and actually do something to fix the problem, not just put words on walls. And so I think it's a wonderful full circle example of someone who was originally ostracized, brought into the community, and then becomes the voice that can actually help the other organization find their way when they may have gotten lost. And so Dapper Dan's autobiography is inspiring. It's a fascinating tale about the American dream and he's incredibly well dressed. So, you know, if you're looking for your latest fashion tip, he probably has that as well. That's awesome. Thanks, Lucas. Yeah, certainly. My pleasure. That was Lucas Welsh, Senior Director of Content and Communications at High Spot. Mm -hmm.